As parents, you want to have all the answers, and we can help with that. Welcome to Boston Children's Answers, Kids Health, a podcast brought to you by Boston Children's Hospital. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Arnold. As a neonatologist and mom, I'm always looking to the future of pediatric health care and how to help parents raise happy, healthy kids. Join us as we share tips and answers from the nation's number one children's hospital. Now let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome. Today we're going to discuss a very important topic, anxiety. As you know, we like to start each episode with a question from a family to guide our conversation. Here's today's. Hi, my name is Carrie. My question is, how does a parent know what is quote normal anxiety and what is enough to meet a threshold to seek professional help? I see my kids struggle and bounce back, but it seems like everyone is anxious these days. How do I know if I should get him help? I know that this is on the mind of many parents, and it makes sense. We are in a mental and behavioral health crisis right now in this country. You see it all over the news, and the pandemic just made it worse. I did some research and learned that anxiety is one of the most commonly diagnosed mental disorders in children. According to the National Institutes of Health, nearly one in three adolescents aged 13 to 18 will experience an anxiety disorder. Here to help us discuss this topic is Dr. Erica Lee, an attending psychologist at Boston Children's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Hi, thank you so much for having me and for shining a spotlight on this really important topic. So just to introduce myself, I'm a child and adolescent clinical psychologist um, here on our outpatient psychiatry service at Boston Children's Hospital, where I work with children, teens, and families and help them with a wide variety of mental health problems that come up throughout the year. Um, I'm also fortunate enough to help teach and train our future psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, and I was actually lucky to do some of my training here many years ago. Well, we definitely are talking to the right person. So thank you for being here. So. As we get started, can you tell me a little bit about what is anxiety and, you know, why do we seem to be seeing such a rise today, especially in our teenagers? I'm so glad you're starting with this question because often we just assume that everyone knows what we mean by words like anxiety and actually people have different definitions. So just to start there, when I think of anxiety, I think of anxiety as a feeling of worry, fear or tension. An important thing to know is that it's an adaptive, healthy, normal biological response to stress that's happening around us. The way that I often explain it to kids and families is that anxiety is sort of our body's natural anxiety alarm, right? It lets us know like, hey, something's going on, you might wanna pay attention, maybe something dangerous is going on, you have to get your body ready to respond. So this is typically what we often think of as the fight, flight, or freeze response, right? Something's happening, I need to respond, what am I going to do about it? So, you know, again, just, you know, thinking about this, anxiety is not necessarily a bad thing when it helps to protect us. That's why our body was, you know, has evolved to to ha establish anxiety, right? But when it's a problem is when it's, you know, sort of you're having the symptoms of anxiety when there's not true danger. With some children and teens, what we know is that actually their anxiety alarm is a little too sensitive and it can start telling us that there's danger where there isn't necessarily anything to worry about. And so this is what we often think of as kids who start to develop anxiety disorders. And in terms of what it's caused by, our current understanding is that anxiety is caused by a number of factors. So typically a combination of some sort of biological vulnerability, environmental mm -hmm. factors, and then also life experiences. And typical risk factors for developing an anxiety disorder include things like a family history of anxiety, growing up in a stressful environment, and of course any number of personal life experiences and stresses that someone undergoes. But those can all increase the chances that a child develops a clinical level of anxiety. One of the things that you know you keep hearing about um, in our world today, and I'm sure it's due to so many different things between the pandemic and um, all of the stressors that our kids are undergoing, but we're seeing it the rates of anxiety in teenagers uh, rise. Can you tell us a little bit more about that from your perspective and what's your experience? Yeah, it's really already so hard being a teenager. I mean, we all remember because we were all teenagers once, right? That the teenage years are just known to be a little bit stormier. So it's important just to start there, that childhood and adolescence are particularly vulnerable times for kids because they're undergoing so much change. Their brains are still developing. They're still physically growing, right? And especially for our teenagers, they're navigating a lot of high stakes situations at the same time, right? So we know 
know that teens have so many different things that they have to juggle, things like getting good grades and doing well in sports and activities, getting along with other kids, getting into college. And I know every generation says this, but it really feels like for each successive new generation, it's harder to do th those things than the last. It's becoming much more competitive. So there's a lot of pressure to succeed. And we also know that for teenagers, their brains are especially sensitive to what we think of as social reward. So this is why our teenagers care so much. What do other kids think of me? Do I look cute? Am I wearing the right yeah. outfit, right? Am I smart? Do kids see me as popular? Am I doing well in school and in sports, et cetera? Am I accepted? Do I feel like I can be myself and people understand me? That's especially important to our adolescents, but it also means it's a more vulnerable time for them because they have to juggle all of this potential social acceptance or rejection on the backdrop of all the things that we already talked about. And then, of course, we also know that there are just life changes that everyday kids go through, right? So, for example, some of the common ones we know about are what happens if you move? What if your parents decide to separate, right? What if there's something else that's going on at home in terms of stresses? We've seen, obviously, just an enormous shift over the last few years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that created social insecurity, um, physical insecurity, but also financial insecurity for a lot of families. So these are all stresses that kids are carrying around with them while they're just trying to live their everyday lives, their brains are still developing, and they're just trying to fit in at the same time. So it's a tremendously stressful time, and it makes sense that our teens would be especially anxious. So I think you know this, I have a teen, brand new teenager, 13, and a preteen, and I am definitely seeing signs of anxiety. I think as a parent, it's so scary because you don't want to see your child go through that. But, you know, maybe some of it's normal, maybe some of it's not. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you sort of talked a lot about the teenage years, and that makes sense to me, right? I mean, I remember my teenage years, that, that all that high anxiety of school and doing well and fitting in and, oh my goodness, and I'm starting to see that in our, my 13-year-old. But what about the younger kids too? Are, are they having an increase in anxiety as well? I wish I could tell you the answer is no, Dr. Arnold, but the answer is also yes. So even oh. we've no, actually been seeing rates for both anxiety and depression in kids ages 3 to 17 rising for several years before the pandemic. Wow. So we actually saw a, just about a 30% increase since 2016, even in our younger kids. So we're really seeing that kids across the ages are pr feeling pretty stressed. Man, it's tough being a kid nowadays. I, I say that a lot to my kids, actually. And then I think, you know, I, I kind of felt like, you know, F, my parents said that to me when I was a kid, but I, I think it's harder for them than it was for me. Um, I, I feel feel like the anxiety and the pressures are, are growing. I think it's also important to think about kids who've kind of fallen behind in a way or in many ways since the pandemic started. Um, so thinking about the impact of remote learning on so many kids, but also the social isolation had a big impact, especially on our teens. There are all these milestones that they missed, right? So maybe they didn't get to go to prom or they didn't get to go to graduation. Or for our kids who are moving into young adulthood, you know, they maybe started college or went through a significant period of high school and college doing everything remotely. And so we know that there's obviously been tremendous learning loss, but also socially, kids have really missed out on these valuable opportunities to connect with each other and move through those kind of rites of passage that we're used to seeing in the teenage years. That's really interesting because I could honestly, I hadn't thought about it that before, but both of my kids, when the pandemic started, we put them in, you know, we went remote first and then we decided when the schools even went back in, into, you know, in person, uh, I was living in Florida at the time and uh, we decided to keep them in remote uh, learning environments. And when we moved to Boston, we decided to enter back into, you know, a, a traditional school environment and both the kids were really excited but I could see a difference when it came to play dates all of a sudden again. Like, you know, that, you know, sometimes my daughter would be really anxious about, you know, making sure her room is ready and everything is like perfect to play. And, you know, and, and that was not something I had noticed before. Um, so I think you're right. Just the, that, that impact on our kids. How can we as parents like, pick up on those signs, you know, if they're affecting our kids. Yeah, so I think it makes sense. Like, we're kind of out of practice. I think a lot of adults were that way, too, of, like, I don't know how to be around yeah, people anymore. Yeah. I Like, we're very social creatures, and, you know, you get out of practice. You get used to only seeing people via Zoom, yeah. and that's just a very different style of interaction. I think it really helps to just always check in with our kids. How are we okay. feeling about things? You know, are there any things on your mind that you're kind of worried about, or just anything you're unsure about? Maybe it'd be helpful to think about what it would be like ahead of time. Because often the uncertainty is the thing that gets us. I mean, and this is true for adults too, right? Yeah. Like not knowing what's gonna come, what something is gonna be like, that is automatic way for our anxiety and alarms to go off. Of us. And so maybe thinking through ahead of time with your kids could give them opportunities to voice some of those concerns. Sometimes yeah. kids don't even realize they're worrying about those things until someone asks them. 
Yeah, so asking is key. And I think about just looking out for those things that you said are common triggers for anxiety. Moves, you know, big changes, the pandemic, and remote learning. Like, you know, when I think about that, my kids, I'm like, oh, they have a lot of good reasons to be anxious. So I definitely need to check in with them. That's really helpful. So one of the things I wanted to also ask, are there any communities or socioeconomic factors that could potentially also increase uh, a child or an adolescent's risk of anxiety? Absolutely, and I'm so glad you're asking this question, Dr. Arnold, because sometimes we forget that there are communities for sure that are more marginalized and are dealing with more stressors to begin with. These communities that were already underserved or struggling for resources and getting enough support, they were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And that's also true in terms of thinking about mental health, right? So we know that our children who are coming from underserved backgrounds are least likely to get access to high quality care. And the recent data, unfortunately, is also discouraging in this regard. So what it's showing is that our black and our brown, our black and our brown youth, our LGBTQIA plus youth, these are the youth that are more likely to be experiencing things like anxiety and depression. They're also the youth who are more likely to be experiencing victim, peer victimization, to feel marginalized, to experience discrimination. And so these are kids we really want to keep an eye out for in terms of they're already at higher risk and they're less likely to access high quality services. Wow. So it's really important that we focus our energy on those high-risk populations. In thinking about populations that are higher risk or, or marginalized populations especially, you know, I think about my two kids. I mean, they both are from different nationalities, right? So they, they are brown. They have a physical disability as well that is not something that is, you know, you can hide. And so I'm curious if you're also seeing increased risk of anxiety in kids who have maybe some type of a, a disability or other you know health challenge absolutely so kids that we know have a physical disability a medical disability learning disabilities these kids are already at higher risk for developing things like anxiety and it makes sense again life is harder right the world doesn't necessarily understand their needs or may not be able to adapt to the needs that they have and one of the things we know about kids which is so funny once you're an adult and realize how important it is to be your own person and how unique and special that is but you know the number one thing kids always say when they're young is I just want to fit in I don't want to be different I don't want to stand out in any way and so you know there's a higher risk anyway of worrying well I'm not the same as other people in this way this way or this way I think it also points to the importance of intersectionality right which is this idea that if you have more than one marginalized identity the more that you have the higher the risk of developing mental health problems again because there's higher risk for things like marginalization and discrimination and just not having your needs matter understood Wow, yeah, I, I could talk to you forever about intersectionality. I think it's such an important topic that we're not talking enough about. But um, I think for all of us as parents, though, the first thing to think about is, you know, what are the risk factors that my child may have and how can I um, be on top of that for my kid? And Absolutely, really and your kids are really lucky that you're thinking about that with them, <laughs> right? Because it can be hard to talk to your kids about them being different. And so we often say to them, you're the same as everyone else. You're so wonderful. And it comes from such a loving place. And, you know, is there some value in providing an outlet for kids to say, like, okay, here are ways in which you're quote unquote different, but is different bad? And how can we help you feel really affirmed and strong and confident about who you are, even if it's not the quote unquote same as everyone else? Yeah, no, I think you're right. We have to be careful, our words matter. And so how do we encourage our kids and support them um, and help them embrace their differences is, is, is important too. Wow, that's great. Well, I guess in the skeletal world, at least I can say, well, you know, I, I have that too. <laughs> we'll get through this. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so speaking about that, you know, I, as a parent, have some similar risk factors that my kids have. Um, I can't say that I've, I'm immune from anxiety. I think we all have, you know, uh, that risk at a certain level with all that we go through in life. Um, if a parent themselves has anxiety, um, you know, what, how could that impact my child? And, like, what can I do to help? decrease that impact on my child. I, I really appreciate that you're raising this, Dr. Arnold, because sometimes it's hard for parents to say, I'm also anxious too. So you being vulnerable and saying that I think is actually really powerful because it gives other people permission to say, yeah, I kind of worry too. Um, because we know that kids who have a family history of anxiety are more likely to be bon biologically vulnerable okay. to experiencing anxiety themselves. But it's important to know that that doesn't mean that all kids who have a family member with a history of anxiety are gonna go on to develop anxiety, right? So it's not sort of, a, you know, if okay, 
you know, I have a parent who has anxiety, that means I'm absolutely going to have it. Yeah. And the thing that's really important to notice here, and this is often very empowering for parents, is that the environment around your child and the social learning that they pick up from their interactions with you and other trusted important people in their lives actually makes a big difference. We know that kids take their cues from their parents, right? Mm -hmm. So, and when do they most need to take cues from their parents? When something unexpected or scary happens. Right, so these are the opportunities to say, wait, am I actually in danger? What's happening? How do I figure out what's a safe situation versus not? And then even more importantly, how do I respond in the moment? And how do I also cope over the long term? Right. So what this means is that parents, you have an enormous impact <laughs> on how your child responds to anxiety. And sometimes it can be subtle. So I talk to a lot of parents around, OK, so you've come to me and you're describing here are the situations where my child gets really anxious or I notice that they start to panic or they're refusing to do certain things because I think they're worried about something. So great job. That was like the first detective part is done. Yep. But then the second part is how are you responding? Often what we do as parents is we end up rescuing our kids, right? So when they're really uncomfortable, we'll do anything to make them less uncomfortable and less stressed. Yep. <laughs> and sometimes kids can get a little bit demanding, right? Is they can sort of say, well, now we can't do these things or things in the home have to be done this way or we have to do it the same way every time. Mm. And parents think to themselves naturally, well, this is the best way to manage my child's anxiety. And so what I often coach parents on is actually you can end up unintentionally reinforcing and strengthening your child's anxiety. Oh, no. I know. Because on one hand, right, Dr. Arnold, you're saying to them, okay, I have confidence in you. I'm telling you, this is not a, a scary thing. I know you've been scared to go to school. I know you're overwhelmed about be, being on the soccer team or going to play dates, but I totally believe you can do it. But then when we try to take our child and they cry or they avoid or they say it's going to be too hard, we say, you know what, maybe it's better that you stay home. We'll try another time. <laughs> so our kids get confused, yeah. right? Like, what are, do my parents think I can do it? Or do they maybe actually agree with me? This is too dangerous and yeah. this is not a scenario that I can handle. And so parents' responses to their kids' anxiety are enormously powerful. Wow. I probably tend to respond when my kids come to me nervous that they won't be able to do something or they can't. And I'm like, what do you mean you can? You absolutely can. And so I kind of push them the other way to go against their fears. Um, but at the same time, I wonder if I'm making it difficult because there are things that I will tell them absolutely not. Like, you know, because I'm worried about their safety or something like that. And so how do we balance, you know, the anticipatory guidance of helping our kids to be careful of scary situations, but also empowering them to not be scared of the things that right. you want them to be strong for. And this is a great point, right? Because it's complicated. Because every child is different, right? And one 13-year-old is not the same as every other 13-year-old, for example. And so you have to figure out, you know, do I think my kid is ready for X, Y, or Z, you know, challenge? And of course, every parent has their own worries and sort of boundaries around what do I think is appropriate for my child at this age? And yeah. those are absolutely decisions that parents are best equipped to make. When children come to you and they say, I just don't think I can do it, parents' typical response is exactly what you described, Dr. Arnold, which is immediately to be like, but that's ridiculous. Of course you can do it. I have so much confidence in you. But the thing that's interesting is that kids coming to you and saying, I don't think I can do it, is because they don't believe that they can do it. So you may believe that they can do it, but they don't have that same confidence, right? So they get that reassurance from, say, their parent or a teacher or a coach, but then it doesn't last. And so then maybe they need to come back to you again and say, like, wait, are you sure that this is something I can do? What do you think? And so maybe sometimes I say to parents, one way that might be more effective is to try to talk to your kids it's about, okay, I hear you. Like, this makes sense that you would be nervous about doing this thing. Maybe you haven't done it in a long time. Maybe it's the first time you're doing it. Have you ever had to do it? Do something that you've never done before that you haven't done in a long time and how did it go right so helping them really harness their own kind of memories of okay my lived experience says i can do this right in Aww. addition to the encouragement from your parents so that you're helping kids themselves sort of modify the way that they're thinking about their abilities and it sounds like you're giving them the tools in their toolbox to be able to overcome their anxieties when they need to by thinking through a previous example where they did it that's so smart wow thank you all right i'm using that one at home <laughs> What are some of the signs and symptoms that, you know, we as parents need to be looking out for um, that our child may be experiencing anxiety? And does it differ based on, you know, general ages? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So anxiety can definitely look different for different kids. The most obvious one is just expressing a lot of fears and worries, right? So you notice that your kid just kind of seems like a worrier or that they're having difficulty controlling the worry and it's kind of getting in the way of, you know, how they're thinking about the future, how they're getting through the day, that kind of thing. Um, you also want to look out, though, for changes in behavior. And these can be a little bit more subtle and sometimes not be clearly linked to anxiety. So, for example, kids may be more irritable, right? So they just might be crankier, more short-tempered with you. Um, or you may actually notice sometimes that kids start to get sort of um, oppositional with you. So when mm. it's time to do certain things or when you're a they're asked to do certain things or when it's time to go to be with certain people or be in a certain place, kids can start to look like they're maybe just throwing a temper tantrum or they're defying you and they're just saying no. But actually sometimes that can be because they're really panicked and scared about doing the thing. Um, mm. And then you always want to look for avoidance. So avoidance is kind of our behavioral hallmark that oh, we wow. look for in relation to anxiety. And it makes sense, right? So if we go back to this idea that anxiety is our body's natural anxiety alarm, if there's something scary, what do we do? We want to get away from it, right? Yeah. We don't want to be near it. Yeah, so kids sense. who start doing things like avoiding school, avoiding activities, avoiding other kids, mm. avoiding any kind of like specific situation, you know, those might also be signs, hey, my child is, is actually feeling anxious and there's something that's triggering their avoidance. Um, and then other typical things we look for are difficulty sleeping, difficulty kind of winding down, especially at night, any changes um, in their ability to concentrate and kind of, you know, do things they need to do. Typically, you'll see this at school, you know, if their grades start to drop, like any changes really in sort of their general performance that you're used to with kids. Um, and then another common sign, especially in our young ones, are chronic physical complaints. Mm. So these might be things like you know, lots of stomach aches, headaches, mm -hmm. I just don't feel right. Sometimes it's vague aches and pains that kind of don't go away and that you've taken the pediatrician, the pediatrician says, I don't see anything like medically that's going on. That can also be a sign that our kids are feeling kind of worried and something's on their mind and maybe stressing them out. So, you know, thinking about all of those symptoms, it sounds like one of the, the big themes that I heard is avoidance and change um, is sort of a potential warning sign that your child may be dealing with high anxiety. What about um, those kids that are on the quieter side? Um, could they be experiencing anxiety? Yeah, this is so great because it's very easy to miss these kids. So I really appreciate that you're raising this because I think that's another subtle way in which anxiety may appear and we might not notice it. So one thing that's important to know is that anxiety, uh, along with depression, is something we call an internalizing disorder, which means that the symptoms are directed inwards, right? So mm -hmm. an externalizing disorder, something like a kid who says no a lot, like can't follow rules, doesn't listen, those kids become obvious really quickly. But if you've got a kiddo just sort of starts to see a little more withdrawn, maybe appears kind of shy, you know, it's just kind of keeping to themselves more, you know, not raising their hand in class, not sitting with others in the cafeteria, maybe not going to their activities, that kind of thing. They can actually look like, oh, you know, they're just not interested or they're bored, right? Or they're shy. And really what might be happening is they're feeling really panicked or overwhelmed inside, but they're too scared to say anything. Those are the kids that we actually want to keep an extra close eye on. I'm like, you know, I've noticed my child's always been a little bit shy and I wonder if maybe there are certain situations that feel overwhelming for them and especially our teachers they know our kids really well it's like have you noticed any changes in how my child is engaging in the classroom you know are they participating with other kids what happens when they get called on in class that kind of thing wow yeah so that's really important to be asking you know and checking in with your kids then too right it seems like that's if your child's on the quieter side you really have to be a little more vigilant right because there could be really subtle ways in which they're avoiding and it just looks like they're sort of quiet and keeping to themselves but maybe they're actually trying to get out of certain things that stress them out wow that's good to know so thinking about like you know anxiety as a, a diagnosis you know even myself you know, I, I don't know all the different categories and um, the different diagnoses that live within the anxiety spectrum. I was wondering if you could help us understand uh, some of those major categories um, so families are just aware. Absolutely. So the anxiety disorders that are most common in childhood, there's a few of them. So the first one that's very common is called generalized anxiety disorder, and that's exactly what it sounds like. So these are kids who have excessive worries about a lot of things for a lot of reasons. So there's not necessarily any specific trigger for it, but you notice these are kids who are worried about school and their friends and activities and the future and their families and maybe if there's going to be a thunderstorm. Um, I often refer to these kids as like the what if kids because you'll hear them saying well what if this happens or what if this happens or what if this happens because mm -hmm. where their mind is often going to is there's all these possible ways everything could go wrong and so they get really stressed out and yeah. those kids often also tend to experience a lot of like physiological tension and kind of difficulty sleeping because they're just worrying a lot. 
Okay. It's hard to turn it off. Okay. Another common anxiety disorder that we see among kids is separation anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So we know that for our little ones, I'm sure you experienced this with your little ones when they were littler. <laughs> Tiny, yeah. Yes, is that it's normal at a certain age, right? It's like yep. when they're little, it's biologically, again, your alarm says, hey, I don't know these people. I don't know if I should feel okay about my parents dropping me off at daycare yep. because I'm just going to be stuck here with strangers, and that stranger danger is very adaptive. But as children start to get older, some kids develop separation anxiety disorder. So these are the kids who it's very very difficult to separate from their primary caregivers because they worry if we're not together something bad is going to happen to me or something bad is going to happen to my caregivers and so it's really difficult to tolerate the separation Wow and then social anxiety disorder is very common especially among our teenagers so these are our kids who worry a lot about what other people think about them and the fear is I'm going to do or say the wrong thing. I'm going to embarrass myself. People are going to judge me negatively. And so mm -hmm. I start to avoid social interactions because if I just avoid, then there's no opportunity to fall on my face and for people to think negatively of me or for me to do something wrong. So they're really worried about social activities, and they'll think a lot about how those social interactions went beforehand, during, and afterwards, and it just really gets in the way of their ability to do social activities. Wow. So in thinking about those top three, you know, if, is it fair to say that, you know, separation anxiety, much more common in the younger toddler preschool age, and then the social anxiety, I imagine, would start to ramp up in terms of needing to look out for it in the, in the teen years where that social interaction is so important. Um, but then general anxiety disorder probably could affect any age. Is that... Yeah, and so we always want to be thinking about what makes developmental sense, right? So, for example, um, you know, with separation anxiety, that makes a lot of sense when our children are, are young, right? When they're infants, when they're toddlers. This is the time when it should be strange for them to just kind of wander off with strangers yeah. and, <laughs> and feel really comfortable with people they don't know. But once they start moving into, like, later childhood, that's when you think, well, it doesn't kind of make as much sense developmentally. So, you know, if it's hard for a child to, say, attend elementary school because they're worried about separating from their caregivers, that's when you'd want to think about, hmm, I wonder if there's a higher level of anxiety here okay. that we need to address um, and absolutely in terms of the social anxiety I mean you, we can experience that at any age but it definitely starts to increase as we go into our teen years which again makes sense we're really primed for social reward there and the stakes feel really really high yeah. um, with our social interactions when we're adolescents so are there other anxiety disorders that we as parents need to be looking out for? Well, there's another one that's common in childhood that's called selective mutism. So this mm -hmm. is sort of thinking about uh, social anxiety disorder or social phobia as it used to be called, and it's sort of a more intense form. So these are our kids who they are absolutely able to talk, but they are what we think of as selectively mute, so they don't mm -hmm. talk in certain situations. And it's typically situations where they feel really anxious and where they're around people they don't know really well. So commonly you might see that this child is very chatty at home and very engaged, you know, when they're with family or even friends that they know well but when they go to school when they go out into the community when they do activities they just don't talk because they're really really scared so that's sort of another uh, diagnosis that we often see in childhood and then there's others but the last that I'll mention um, is also panic disorder okay. so we have you know a number of kids who when they're anxious they experience panic attacks so panic attacks mm. are sort of these um, really intense physiological expressions of anxiety and, and they typically come out of nowhere so kids suddenly feel like they can't breathe they're sweaty they're shaking so Sometimes they feel dizzy or like they can't see straight. Sometimes kids end up in the emergency room because they're like, something's happening. I think, I think there's something wrong with my heart. Or I felt like I was yeah. about to die and they were actually having a panic attack. Ooh. And I know, it's awful. And in panic disorder, kids frequently have panic attacks and they worry a lot about when they're going to have the next panic attack. And so they're very attuned to like physical signs from their bodies that they may be about to have one. Okay. Well, that's got to be so hard. Um, you just hate to think about kids having to go through that, but... Um, but individuals like you can help them. So, um, you know, thinking about that too, I imagine that some of these anxiety uh, disorders can also be commonly found with other diagnoses. Are there any associations that parents maybe need to be on the lookout for as well? Right, so it's so important to mention this. It's something that we think of called comorbidity, which means okay. that when more than one disorder is occurring at the same time, and what we know actually is that having one anxiety disorder increases the chances that you may have another one of the anxiety disorders, and it also increases the chances that you'll have depression. So as mm -hmm. I was saying before, right, anxiety and depression are both internalizing uh, disorders. And unfortunately, it makes a lot of sense. If you're worrying a lot, right, and you're worrying so much that it's getting in the way of your everyday life, you kind of start to feel bummed out, right? Because you're missing out on things and depending on how restricted your life has become because of the anxiety, because of the avoidance, because it just feels really hard and overwhelming, 
that's kind of a nice fast track pathway to feeling sad and down mm. and feeling really isolated um, and alone at times. And so, you know, we really want to kind of be on the lookout to say, if my child is experiencing a clinical level of anxiety, I want to get them the support that they need so we can reduce the chances of developing other kinds of anxiety disorders or something like depression. Mental health is so important. We have to take care of our mental health as much as our physical health. Absolutely. Um, it's very challenging. Well, I'd like to take a minute to circle back to our question from Carrie. Um, and at the beginning of the episode, she um, you know, wanted to know, how do you decide if your child needs treatment? And um, so I'd like to ask, you know, even before you decide on treatment is how do you diagnose uh, having you know, an anxiety disorder? And then I'd love to chat about treatment. So uh, as a reminder, we all worry, <laughs> unfortunately. We all know this experience well. And anxiety is something that everyone experiences all around the world. And the general rule of thumb of what we're looking for when we're thinking is a clinical level of anxiety where intervention might be useful is to think about functioning. So your child or your teenager is worrying. How is that impacting their day to day, right? Are they right. still able to do the things that they want and need to do during the day? Are they able to go to school, activities, see friends, get along with family, et cetera? Um, or are they routinely having you know really big struggles with worry where it's hard to control where it's making it difficult to sleep and to concentrate and again to do their daily activities is this something where you're noticing when they're asked to be in certain situations or given certain requests that you're noticing really big outsized reactions you know how is it impacting their daily life and when families come and they say, yeah, it's kind of getting in the way, maybe these things are going well and these things not so much, but we're noticing that here's where the anxiety is kind of making things a bit sticky, that's where you want to check in. So checking in first with your child to say, hey, you know, I've kind of noticed, you know, a few things and saying that really calmly and lovingly and non-judgmentally, especially for our teenagers yes. and saying, I just want to check in with you and I'm wondering, I'm wondering how you're doing and if, if this feels like maybe something that, that's getting in the way or feeling kind of hard for you. Um, and one thing I often encourage families to do is to, you know, kind of jot down your observations. Parents know their kids best, and you often see them so much more <laughs> than any clinician that you're going to go see. And so kind of jot down some notes of, like, here are some things I've noticed are, are getting hard for my child, or here are things they used to be able to do, and now this kind of worry seems to be getting in the way. Because those may be things that your kids recognize, and they meant the things your kids don't recognize. And then when you go to a professional, you know, you can kind of say, okay, here's what I've noticed. And that behavioral health professional should spend some time talking to both you and your child okay. to say, hey, what's going on? Where are you noticing things kind of aren't feeling so great? What feels like it's really hard to do? Like, you know, what's getting in the way? And then usually they will give you some standardized questionnaires. Okay. So, you know, we have parent and child versions of these different standardized questionnaires that have been normed on thousands and thousands of people where you can basically sit down and you independently of your child can kind of report, here are the symptoms I've noticed and here's how much they're getting in the way of my child's daily life. And then together with those two things, the person should be able to say to you, okay, here's what I think might be going on. And we have to, of course, spend more time getting to know each other. Yep. But initially, here's what I'm, I'm thinking might be going on diagnostically. And here's what I would recommend in terms of intervention. Yeah, so it's really a science, right? So it's it's you have to sort of look at the the symptoms that you're seeing in your child and, and talking about that with the clinician that you're meeting with, but then it's also, I mean, you have questionnaires that can help us to nail it down. Um, you know, when I've, I've, I've screened for my kids for anxiety and depression, I found those questionnaires really helpful because I, I almost felt, I don't know, worried that as a parent, I might be giving a skewed perception of what I'm seeing, right? You know, and you, I don't know, maybe just that's just me, but probably all of us as parents, we want what's best for our kids, but we also sometimes doubt our, you know, our, our senses and what we're picking up on. So I, I personally found the test and the, the questionnaires to be validating that it wasn't just me or it wasn't just my child complaining of, of X, Y, or Z, but there's really something going on there. Yeah, and a lot of kids actually say that too. It's like, oh, like I'm not the only person who experiences it. And then sometimes seeing it in a list, it can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes it's like oh I have all of these but it can also be just like you said really validating yeah. because they're like oh well there's a standardized list here because these are the common symptoms that people experience when they're experiencing a high level of anxiety and so it's like yes this describes me this describes me this describes me 
We also find that, you know, of course we're going to do our clinical interview. We're going to try to create a really safe and comfortable space where kids and parents can talk about the things that are getting in the way. But sometimes that feels overwhelming too, right? It can feel embarrassing. You feel sort of guilty or ashamed or it's anxiety provoking to talk about anxiety. Yeah. yeah. And so sometimes writing it down feels easier. Like I can just check off. These are the things that are bothering me and to this extent. Sometimes that feels a little bit easier than saying it out loud too. So it just gives us another way to collect that information. And then, you know, uh, knowledge is power, right? So once we have working diagnoses, then you can go for treatment. So I'm curious, um, you know, how does a clinician decide if their child, if, if your child may need treatment? Um, so some of it is based on what we just talked about, right? So what is what are the symptoms? What is the level of impairment, right? So how much is it getting in the way of your daily okay. life, right? That's kind of the key thing. It's like, okay, well, you know, yeah, my, my child t- kind of gets nervous sometimes when they have to give a book report or when they have to perform in a certain activity in front of other people, but they're generally okay and they go to school. So there's a spectrum. Then we have the kids who are sort of saying, like, well, school just feels too hard and too overwhelming, and so I just don't go anymore, <laughs> right? So you can kind of think about how much is it getting in the way, yeah. and really what are the family's goals. I think that's such a big important Mm. part of that conversation is what are you noticing isn't working and where do you want to be? And individually having that conversation with kids and also with parents because they may agree on what the goals are and sometimes they may disagree but really getting that buy-in of what do you wish was different in your life and how can we support you in getting there? And so that may lead to a combination of different interventions but often it's based on how uh, severe the symptoms how long have they been going on, and how much are they getting in the way? I think for all parents who may be going through this process with their child, it's just helpful to know, like, okay, this is this. I may need to start thinking about treatment here. So, you know, again, uh, what what are the different treatments or interventions that um, you can offer to to kids who may be dealing with anxiety? Right, so that for those kids who would benefit from working with a mental health professional, the gold standard treatment for anxiety is a type of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's often referred to as CBT, so sometimes families have at least heard that acronym before. Yep. Um, and it can be delivered individually, it can be delivered in groups of kids who are around the same age, who have a similar type of diagnosis or you know difficulty with anxiety. And in CBT, the focus is on helping kids understand the connections between their thoughts their feelings, and their behaviors. And the theory behind it is that the way that we think about a situation or interpret that situation has a lot to do with how we're then going to feel about it. Mm -hmm. And how we feel about it has a lot to do with then how we react or how we behave in that situation. Okay. And so helping kids kind of slow down the process, because obviously when we're anxious, it's usually panic, and then we're just out, we're just avoiding, and we're not doing this anymore. And so how do we slow down that process and recognize, okay, what were you thinking in this situation, and how were you interpreting something as scary or threatening? How were you then feeling? How did that then you know drive your behavior? And how do we actually turn that cycle around? So mm. uh, often it's a cycle that's reinforcing itself negatively, right? So like I'm thinking to myself, I can't possibly take this test tomorrow because I'm going to fail it. I'm just not good at math. Now I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I can't sleep. Maybe I'm angry. Who cares about fourth grade math? This is so unreasonable anyway. No one's ever going to use this again. And then when my parents get me up to go to school the next day, I am absolutely not going. I'm throwing a fit. I'm telling them I don't feel like I haven't slept all night. I have to stay home. And then, of course, I don't take the test, so I don't have the opportunity to see that I might have done okay. Mm. Um, So what we're trying to help kids do is recognize, how are you thinking about a situation? Is there any other way to look at it? Is there any way, other way to predict that something different might happen? How can we draw on our previous experiences yeah. to have a sense of how this might go? And is that going to lead to us feeling, even if we don't feel 100% better, maybe we feel calmer, maybe we feel less overwhelmed. And does that then enable us to engage in behavior that's more useful to the situation and gives us opportunities actually to feel confident and overcome our fears? It's almost like a reset of the mindset, right? You're thinking so that then your your feelings, your emotional response is not as severe so that hopefully then you can carry on with whatever it is that you're trying to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. We're helping kids recognize they can retrain their brains. Like thoughts are actually something we can, we can somewhat control, but more importantly that we can change. And that's often sort of mind-blowing for a lot of kids. Like, oh, wow, like I had a thought. I have thousands of thoughts a day. Wait, that means I could have thousands of other thoughts that I initiate and that I create and then I could change the way that I see a situation. 
And related to that, you know, depending on the type of anxiety or anxiety disorder that a child has, sometimes we will also try a more behavioral approach, something called exposure therapy. Hmm. So this is the idea that we slowly, gradually, and safely approach the things that we're scared of instead of avoiding, okay. right? Because when we avoid, we feel better in the short term. We immediately feel better. Like, okay, so I didn't go to school. This is fantastic. I got out of the test, <laughs> yes. right? But because I avoided, I didn't get the chance to see that even if I didn't do as well in the test as I would have wanted to because I was anxious, I knew a lot. I could have tried my best and it would have felt like, okay, I could do this. It wasn't the best experience. I'm not signing up to take more pop quizzes tomorrow, <laughs> but actually I can do this and it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. We miss Thanks. out on that when we avoid. So exposure therapy says, how do I really gradually and in slow kind of steps approach things so that I can see, okay, I approached it and I didn't love it, but it wasn't so bad. And now actually I feel a little bit braver and I can approach on another level and it actually wasn't so bad. That's a way also to overcome our fears because you replace the avoidance experience with the approach experience. Um, an approach decreases anxiety and avoidance increases it. So it's kind of doing the opposite. Ah, that's, that's so smart. I, I'm, I'm taking this all in <laughs> for my own life and my kid's life too. How do you know if the, a child might need other therapies, like medical therapies or anything like that in terms of medications? Um, absolutely. So there are definitely some kids where medications can be a really important part of their treatment plan. Um, and SSRIs are sort of our gold standard okay. medications in that regard. One thing that's... Uh, I guess helpful. I, I say that. I say that he, with some hesitation. Um, is that SSRIs are also sort of the frontline medication intervention for depression. So one thing that can yeah. be helpful in that sense is we don't love it when our kids have symptoms of both anxiety and depression. But if they do, an SSRI can actually help target symptoms of both. And often, just I look at kids and I try to understand from them and their family how distressed are they? Because some mm -hmm. kids are sort of like, I can get through the day but it's torturous, yeah. it's exhausting, I feel overwhelmed the whole time, I'm just really, really panicked and scared a lot of the day, and so I can get through, but with a little bit of medication, would I actually feel sort of braver and more capable and more able to kind of attack some of my fears and maybe even do some of the things that I'm trying to do in therapy? And definitely for some of our kids, it just helps to have some medication to make it a little bit easier uh, to get going. That makes sense, that makes sense. So looking at each kid differently and, and sort of, kind of putting all those pieces together seems like it could really, really help a lot of kids who need it. That's great. So Dr. Lee, I, I imagine that uh, a lot of parents out there, I mean, just people in general, are reluctant to seek help uh, when they need mental health support, um, which is obviously to me such a shame. And so I was just curious um, if you have any advice for those individuals that might be hesitant and or what are the risks if we don't seek help when we need it. A lot of families struggle with this, and a lot of kids struggle with this too, right? I think we've come a long way relatively in this country in terms of being able to talk about mental health. You know, kids get social emotional learning in school now, which is just kind of an amazing yeah. revelation for the younger generations. And it's still so hard to say, I'm struggling, and I think my child is struggling. And it's especially hard, understandably, for parents because there's often a lot of guilt and shame that comes up with, oh my gosh, my child's having a mental health problem. And what does this mean about me as a parent and, and what I've done wrong? Um, so I know that parents are always too hard on themselves. What I would say is that the risks of not treating a clinical level of anxiety are pretty negative. One of the myths actually are that if a child has an anxiety disorder, that it will resolve on its own. <laughs> Typically what we know is that anxiety continues to get worse and it continues to actually then kind of um, continue into adulthood. And then you see even more impairment. Because if you think about mm -hmm. some of the symptoms we talked about, right? So excessive worry, like difficulty kind of shutting off the worry, maybe avoiding more situations and kind of making your world a little bit smaller than it used to be be difficulty sleeping, difficulty eating, difficulty concentrating, right? All of these things are absolutely going to get in the way of your child and then your teenager and then your young adult and then your adult's life. What we know actually is that the earlier we intervene, the, the higher the chances are that this is something that we can kind of get a handle on and get a handle on sooner. And also, if you bring your child and they're having a low or medium level of anxiety, it's going to be easier to treat than if you come mm -hmm. and your child's really struggling or has been avoiding for a long time or is actually in some sort of crisis because they're so overwhelmed. So I always encourage families, if you've got some professionals on your side to help you figure out what do I think is going on and how do I distinguish, as you've been asking me, between what is a typical level of anxiety for a young person and what is a level of anxiety that we need to do something about. 
Yeah, so don't be afraid to seek help because it can really make a difference. And it, and it's sort of, to me, it's sort of one of those things that we do as parents, right? We want to set up our kids for success into adulthood. We want them to be independent and successful and happy and and healthy, right? And this is, you know, just another aspect of that. Don't be don't be afraid to, to seek help early. So. Absolutely, and it's a way to model for your kids, right? It's a way to say, mm-hmm. like, hey, sometimes we can't figure it all out ourselves. We don't have to keep it all inside. This is something I'm here to help you with. I want to talk to you about what's going on. I want to make sure you're getting the right supports. And we know that there are treatments that work, right? We have gold standard interventions yeah. for a reason, and so you don't have to just sort of white knuckle through the things that really stress you out. We can do something about this, and you can be on the path to feeling better. That's great. That's so good to hear as a parent, um, you know, that there's there's hope for our kids who may be dealing with these issues today. So how, how can I help their teachers to be supportive and, you know, their, maybe the community that they're living within so that they don't get teased or, or um, you know, just sort of pointed out for any reason? Uh, can they help or can I encourage the community to help my kids who may have anxiety? Yeah, so of course it depends on the individual child because everyone has sort of different relationships um, with their community members and also different risk factors. But what I often say to families is who would you feel comfortable telling that you think can play a supportive role in your child's life? Mm -hmm. So you brought up teachers, obviously they're an essential part of our children's ecosystems, often school counselors are as well. But are there other trusted people that they would feel comfortable knowing like, hey, you know, when I'm at sports practice, I'm gonna feel a little nervous. You know, sometimes you might ask me to do something new or it might be before a game and my child might look a little bit shut down or uninterested but actually I think they're going to be kind of stressed and so thinking with your kids about who would be helpful and how they can then support you and really then thinking with those adults okay well if we give you this information what are we now asking you to do in terms of your support to my child so for example for a teacher is it like well you know my kid might need to take some breaks during the day or I know a lot of classrooms now have what we think of as like calming corners where Mm -hmm. kids can go and take a break and you know there's like you know space there to sort of relax and reset take a few deep breaths you know maybe use some fidget toys some other calming activities before kind of coming back and re-engaging in the classroom and so giving a teacher heads up can be really helpful sort of saying it's not that child doesn't care about school you know they're trying to pay attention they're just feeling really stressed or worried about something and so here are ways that we could support them and you know it's interesting that you bring up the point about being teased because kids are really tough on each other and you can tease kids for literally anything and so this is absolutely not an exception in that way And so again, talking with your child about what it is that they're experiencing and helping them feel empowered to understand what it is that's happening to them and then what they're going to do about it. And it's interesting because I work with many kids and families who often are very nervous about bringing this up and talking about it, But then the more that they talk about it and the more that they feel in control of their emotions, the more confident they feel, right? Because they're not just at the mercy of however I feel or what my worry is going to kind of pull me around to do that day. I understand what's happening to me. I understand why I'm feeling anxious and what's making me anxious. And now I've built up some coping skills for knowing what to do on the other side so I feel more in control. And that naturally is going to make me less vulnerable to the impact of other kids because I'm going to know myself really well and be able to do things to help myself when I'm having a hard time. And mm-hmm. so empowering kids with skills in that way can also be very protective. That's really great. So again, talking about it, you know, just helps to empower, could empower your child, it sounds like, but also it could maybe even normalize it for them. I, I don't know, I, I have this hope mm-hmm. that the next generation of kids are gonna become adults where talking about our, our mental health is not um, a scary thing and that we feel empowered to talk about it and to and to you know help make it better so that we are healthy. Yeah, and knowing even as a young person, I mean, it's enormously powerful, right, to be able to say, I've had an experience with this, but it doesn't define me. Yeah. Right? Like, I am not my anxiety. My whole life is not my anxiety. Anxiety is something that I experience, but also I understand it now, and I know how to cope with it, and that actually makes, I now have superpowers. I now know what to do when I'm feeling overwhelmed or when I'm feeling out of control and how to reset, and that's then amazing knowledge and strength and resilience that they take into the rest of their lives. That's and great. so I guess that goes back to our point of before about earlier intervention yes. is better. Oh my goodness, that's great. Another thing I think is also important to be aware of and to be sensitive to always are just thinking about cultural differences and nuances around individual families understanding and their own conceptualization of what's happening for a child that they have who has anxiety. Uh, you know, so thinking about, you know, who would I tell, right? So of course there's mm. different cultural sensitivities too around what kind of information do we share outside of the family, who needs to know, and what do we think they're going to do with that information. Um, but it's also, you know, important to recognize that families may have had varying 
levels of experience with you know other professionals so that not only just mental health professionals but that could be teachers that could be school counselors that could be coaches or neighbors I and mean, how do we you know best support them and help them kind of take the lead in who do I want to tell and who needs to know and what's yeah. the purpose of telling them yeah that's a really good point and I think it's obviously it's going to vary for each individual family and and situation um, but I know you know as a parent that's definitely something that I'm always thinking about you know because you want to protect your kids and you want to make sure that someone's not going to use that information about your child um, against them you'd rather them obviously use it to, to help them to be more successful so thank you for that Dr. Lee, this has been such an eye-opening conversation so far, and I am learning a ton, as I'm sure our entire audience is. Um, you know, I'm curious from your perspective, given the fact that, you know, mental health is such an important hot topic today, um, is there any research related to um, anxiety and anxiety disorders that maybe our audience would like to hear about? Yeah, so actually two projects come to mind. I'm sure there are many others because our faculty are working very hard to understand behavioral health problems and, and the next generation of solutions. But the first one that comes to mind is a project that's being run by Dr. Heather Walter here in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. Is. So she's one of our senior psychiatrists, and she's been working with pediatricians. So we know that pediatricians are on the front lines of behavioral health care, right? So pediatricians are the people that you go to first. They've got these long-lasting, trusting relationships with families um, because they see patients regularly and they know you over a long time. Um, but we also know that PCPs often report that they don't have enough training. They don't have a lot of tools to screen for behavioral health problems, to understand how to address them, to know what the right interventions are. And what Dr. Wall Walter has done that's really fascinating is collaborating with our pediatric practices. She's developed a comprehensive program called the Behavioral Health Integration Program, or BHIP, mm -hmm. which is designed to then basically train pediatricians mm -hmm. to more safely and effectively care for the behavioral health problems that they most commonly see in primary care. So this includes anxiety, depression, and ADHD, right? Which probably mm -hmm. sounds familiar to many of your yes. listeners because these are the most common things that our kids are coming with. Um, and her program actually has three really interesting parts. So there's this first comprehensive education about each of those disorders. And then there's this really nice on-demand consultation with psychiatrists about how do we apply what we've learned to wor our work with individual patients and families. Mm -hmm. And then there's also support for saying, how do we help your practice become more integrated? So how do we help you get behavioral health clinicians into your practice where they're working right alongside the pediatricians and then can offer more support to families that are coming there for pediatric care? Um, and it's been fascinating to see the reach of this program. You know, she's reached over 80 practices with over 500 PCPs across wow. the state and actually this program has also led to over a hundred behavioral health clinicians being integrated into these primary care practices. Wow. I know it's amazing and what the research is showing is that it's increasing behavioral health screening, it's increasing behavioral health services, it's increasing the number of behavioral health visits within those primary care practices and it's also improving medication management as we mentioned before of those three major problem areas so anxiety, depression, and ADHD. That's huge. I mean, given the fact that right now with this mental health crisis, we it's so hard to access uh, mental health providers. So the work that she's doing is directly impacting that and making that better. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. Um, and another project I'd like to give a highlight to is about prevention. So Dr. Michelle Bosquet Enlo is a developmental and clinical psychologist in our department, and she specializes in infant mental health. And it's really fascinating mm. because her and her team are working to identify brain signatures that they can non-invasively identify in infancy, and that can be used to predict whether or not a child is going to be at a higher risk for developing anxiety. Wow. Fascinating, I know. That is really I fascinating. I know, it's you hard know, to wrap your mind. I'm a so yeah. I'm like, that is so cool. <laughs> it's hard to wrap our brains around, but this idea of like, could we better predict and could we better pick up on something like say, for example, through an EEG, what Dr. Basque and Lo is trying to understand is could we better understand earlier, are there signs for increased anxiety? And so does that give us more room to intervene earlier than we are able to right now? Wow. I mean, it's just fascinating how quick medicine and research is moving and the fact that we could sort of, even even if it just helps you to know that you're at higher risk so that parents can be, you know, prepared with the tools to look out for signs and symptoms to help with intervention earlier because intervention earlier makes all the difference in the world. So, right. And both of these projects are really saying how do we approach this problem from new innovative ways, right? So yeah. how do we improve sort of screening and treatment at the pediatrician level? How do we then also come in from infancy? Um, yeah. So these are just two of the projects that are happening in the department. That's exciting. Wow. 
Very cool. Okay, keep me updated on how those are going because I'm really, I can't wait to learn more. <laughs> We've talked about so many great things related to anxiety and um, I, I just want to know if there's anything that we haven't discussed that you thought would be really important for our listeners to, to know or to hear about. So one of the questions that I often get asked from families once they land in my office is, what do I need to know? And so I always like to give a little bit of a plug of here are some questions that it might be helpful to ask if you end up working with a behavioral health professional um, for your child. The first that you want to look for, are, is this a person with expertise in kids? And I know that might sound a little bit silly and obvious, yeah. but not everyone works with kids. There are plenty of psychologists and, and social workers and wonderful counselors out there who only work with adults or only work with the elders or only maybe even work with certain populations of children and teens. And so you want to know, do they have the training and experience to help a family like yours? I mean, I think that's so important for all aspects of health with our kids, right? Whether it's mental or physical, again, because kids aren't just little adults. Absolutely, they, they are not little adults. Yes. yes, and they don't have fully formed brains. And depending on how old they are, it really is a very different kind of approach in terms of thinking about engaging them in therapy. Yeah. That's such a good point. Um, so asking them, you know, okay, so how does this work? How are you going to evaluate my child? Okay. How do you decide what the recommendations are? How do you, you know, similar to the questions you asked me, how do you come up with a diagnosis? Um, you know, is this an evidence-based intervention, right? Does the research and science show that this is the most appropriate treatment for my child who has this type of thing or things? Um, and then also, why is this the approach that you'd recommend? How are we going to work together? So what's my role or my job as the caregiver, mm -hmm. as someone who really loves this child? You know, how are you going to spend time with them? What are you going to do with me? What is my level of involvement? Um, and also, are there other people you think should be part of the conversation? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's really helpful for behavioral health clinicians to also talk to teachers or other important caregivers in your child's life just to make sure they've got a full understanding and can be as supportive and useful to your family as possible. Um, and then lastly, you know, confidentiality is always important. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the hallmark of what of our work and what we do. And so I'm sure that you, when you're in front of a behavioral health clinician, they're going to bring it up. But it's often something that's on the minds of kids and their parents. So don't hesitate to ask questions. It's really essential for kids that parents are often empowered to be part of that process from the beginning. And that kids feel empowered to say, this is the level of involvement that I feel comfortable with. And I want to know what's going to happen moving forward if I'm sharing really private, personal details with you. So really making sure that you feel comfortable asking the question of things that you're not sure about and you want to know how it's going to work, it's okay to grill, grill us a little bit. <laughs> That's good to know. Thank you for that advice because um, I think you bring up such a good point that we need to feel comfortable, right? I mean, because, I mean, this is important, you know, work that we're doing together. And I imagine it's a two-way street, right? And so if I'm the parent or, you know, my child, we need to feel really comfortable that uh, we can you know, share what's on our minds, you know, be transparent and safe to do so, so that we can really get the most out of those, those, uh, those experts in our lives. Absolutely. Sometimes it's hard for families who are seeking help to get help and treatment. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like that you're, Dr. Arnold, that you're bringing up sort of where do we start and, and how do we even get treatment. So absolutely, there's a lot of programs here at the hospital, including Dr. Walter's BHIP program that I was just describing to help us integrate behavioral health into primary care and with all these different primary care partners uh, in the community, because the goal really is to say, how do we reach children where they are? And then, of course, we've noticed since before the pandemic, but especially since the pandemic with the explosion in behavioral health needs, that we really need to expand the mental health workforce. And so I know that Boston Children's is working very hard to make that a reality. And often families, when you're feeling concerned, when you're unsure, especially if you're kind of nervous, and I'm not sure if what's happening with my child is reaching the level of needing more um, professional support, talking to your pediatrician can be enormously helpful because they mm -hmm. feel like a safe person and sometimes your child feels better talking to them too. Another avenue to getting really great um, integrated care um, is through a program here at Boston Children's called the Boston Children's Neighborhood Partnerships Program, or BCHNP. So this is a fantastic school-based behavioral health program that's actually working in partnership with Boston Public Schools and has for many years, that's really committed to working with school communities that are most impacted by systematic inequities. That's actually where we know that kids are during yeah. most of the day, yeah. which is at school, and how do we increase training, and how do we really provide better evidence in space culturally responsive services to meet kids where they are. Wow, that's so important. So again, you know, just thinking about starting with your pediatrician, great resource. Um, you know, there's more and more pediatric programs that are having integrated mental health uh, care. And then, 
through our schools. The work that's going on through um, the Boston Children's Neighborhood Partnership is really exciting and hopefully a model that um, other schools across the, the country will take on because you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the one place our kids are and our teachers know our kids uh, very well as well. It's, it's really exciting. Now on to the part of the show we're calling Doctor's Orders, where we prescribe you an action that you can take today to make you and your family healthier. Dr. Lee, what are our Doctor's Orders for today? So I'm actually going to piggyback off of something that you said, Dr. Arnold, in our conversation, which I was thinking in my head, you nailed it, which is that mental health is, is health. You know, we're so used to thinking about physical health and mental health being very different things. But as I often say to families, if your child had a medical illness, if they weren't feeling well, if you learned that your child had a chronic medical condition, most families would not even hesitate. They would say, what are the doctor's orders? What's the evidence-based intervention here? And how do we move towards improving my child's quality of life? And it is the same thing for mental health. Our mental health is something that we carry with ourselves all the way through to the end of our lives. And so really equipping your kids with the resilience and the language to be able to talk about things that are hard and to know how to cope with them is incredibly confidence building. It's incredible, incredible for resilience building. And it really helps kids go out there and be better equipped to handle the everyday or sometimes not so everyday stresses that come our way. So I just really encourage families to start that conversation and to know you will better equip your kids to go out there and handle everyday life if they feel really confident in taking care of their me mental health just as they take care of their physical health. Wow, thank you so much for that, Dr. Lee. And it's so important for all of us to pay attention because there's lots of parts of being healthy. Thank you so much for your insight, Dr. Lee. And a big thank you to our guest parent, Carrie. If you want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on the latest episodes. And for more information, check us out at bostonchildrens.org slash kidshealth or find us on Boston Children's Hospital's social media pages. Thank you and be well.